I see uh, the uh, chairman of uh, the UMT system in the back, Lee Jackson. Let's give him a hand for being here. So uh, let's go and get started. Mike Morrissey is going to do the first presentation. Mike. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, my name is Michael Morris. I'm the Director of Transportation at the North Central Texas Council Government Center. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to be here. I'm going to summarize three to four billion dollars worth of projects that are programmed for the Southern Dallas area. I'm going to cover them pretty quickly um, so you can understand what the inventory looks like. Um, we use the term system, so we're not just building projects. They're an integrated multimodal transportation system. Um, and then my two colleagues uh, will follow up with more detailed presentations on Southern Gateway uh, and on the Trinity. At your place, or when you came in, you saw a brochure on uh, sustainable development. In the end, transportation has a positive impact on economic development. Uh, we would like to see Southern Dallas grow. I'll talk about uh, initiatives uh, to do that, but if you want more detail, I don't have time to talk about that program today. Please look at that uh, information. Under federal law, and it's our office's responsibility to implement, we have to plan 20 years into the future. You don't have the luxury of planning yesterday or two days from now. Uh, so a lot of the information that we talk about is 2035 or 2015. You'll see our office now transition to 2040 uh, for the next transportation uh, plan. I'm going to go pretty fast. I'm going to inventory a lot of uh, projects. I hope you see the benefits of the system of uh, projects. Uh, and my goal of being here today is to enhance communication. I sense there's lots of communication. It isn't necessarily being communicated to the right group at the right time. So today, uh, we can create better relationships and partnerships and communication and understanding. I think it's the best, goal, best path forward. The presentations you'll see will all be posted on the COG website, and all these presentations will be given to Senator West for him to put on his website. So don't try to take a lot of notes because we will make these all these presentations available to you uh, probably Monday so you can go through them. Here's the demographic forecast. Um, we're moving out to 2040. We're planning for a region of 10 and a half million people. Next month you'll see the agency talk about the existing population. It's probably closer to 6.8 million. The region has added a million people every decade since 1960, and that trend is going to continue. You cannot have a region of 10.5 million people without a stronger employment base. The new forecast for employment in downtown uh, exceed 180,000 workers. So if you're trying to put a region together of 10.5 million people, you're going to start seeing these additional nodes of employment, including the Dallas and Fort Worth Central businesses. Here's inventory of systems. The Texas Transportation Commission has funded 183, um, the old uh, airport freeway, um, Interstate 30, Kelly is finishing up Interstate 30 that goes out towards Arlington. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the SM Wright project, which is fully funded and under construction. You see a gap in between there. Uh, that's the Trinity project, the yellow line. Uh, that NPTA is uh, responsible for, and then you see the yellow line heading south, that is the Southern Gateway project. Uh, if you squint, you can see the Horseshoe project. So Interstate 30 integrates into the Horseshoe, integrates into Southern Gateway, all with the uh, inclusion of a Trinity Parkway as part of this mix of projects. The green lines are funded. The yellow lines are in the process of being funded. Um, probably Southern Gateway furthest along than the uh, Trinity Project. Here's SM Wright. SM Wright will extend 175 over to Interstate 45 in this section. Uh, we're eliminating 
Dead Man's Corner. Uh, horrible safety problem. We have approval to move this traffic now up Interstate 45 uh, under the assumption from the Federal Highway Administration that you're eventually going to build the Trinity Project because this is actually phase one of the Trinity Project as it heads to the west. Once that traffic moves over to 45, we can tear down the SM right structure and return that to a European thoroughfare street, Euro European boulevard as part of that process. So we first have to open it up for traffic to 45, then we can come back in and do uh, the thoroughfare street project. Outcome, economic development, sustainable development, similar to the brochure that I showed you. Huge safety benefits, uh, huge community benefits, huge regional benefits as a result of the SM right project. The Regional Transportation Council has it funded. Mayor Frankie is one of those members on the Regional Transportation Council. Um, we have slotted the last phase. Remember, that phase can't go to construction until the traffic opens up over 45. We are proposing, with your approval of the Proposition 1 fund and the approval of Senator West's creation of those funds going to a constitutional vote, um, Proposition 1 fund will fund the last remaining section uh, of the SMRI project. 35E, your Dallas District Engineer, Kelly Selman, will talk about this in more detail. This is a project the Senator led, uh, developing consensus uh, from the communities. It has different segments associated with it. This is a, what we call a thermal speed map. We collect all the navigational data that's on all the three ways. Um, this happens to be for a whole month. Each row is a different day of the week. Um, this is like a weather map. If it's purple, uh, it's slower or not as good. Uh, here you are northbound, probably not far from the Senator's office. This is what 35E looks like every day in the month of February, where basically northbound is shut down, speeds under 20 miles an hour. <coughs> this project traffic reverses in the afternoon, so you don't see the huge uh, slowdown. But look at these purple uh, areas of uh, congestion that occurs, uh, and it is because uh, this facility is so old and speeds are so high, the accident rate is three times on this quarter of the statewide average, and why so much attention would be given, given to this project. In addition, under state rule, we have to focus on the priorities of the state. The state of Texas has indicated this project to be the 20th most congested project in the whole state of Texas in the Southern Gateway area. Our office and Kelly's office has to respond to the legislature uh, with regard to how we are responding to these most congested facilities. So you have a bad combination here. Old design, which Kelly's going to talk about, congested facilities, and high accident rate resulting in an unreliable facility. I'm just going to flag a few numbers, 300,000 cars in the future. Uh, this is what we have to address, uh, different phases and different stages. I'm going to leave you to Kelly in his presentation. Quick civics lesson. Um, in the state legislature, uh, over the last 10 years, the state gave us lots of tools and ability to toll. So you see this teeter-totter with that really low. <coughs> They're working very hard to change the pendulum, the pendulum away from tools and tolls to more of a pay-as-you-go system. Proposition 1 passed. Lots of bills are being introduced. We're, we're watching this very closely. Our local elected officials would love to see this pendulum swing so they don't need to use as many tools and tolls as they uh, have those particular projects. If the legislature is unsuccessful, I think you're going to see the local elected officials continue to use tools and tolls, but there's nothing that would make them happier than to have a more balanced transportation investment system. At the federal level, in my opinion, it's moving in the opposite direction. The Congress did fund transportation. They're not doing too well right now. That's the nicest way I can say that. Uh, their move into copy Texas. They're moving towards tools and, toll, uh, tools and tolls. They're not going to be probably under transportation like we would wish they would be. 
Southern Gateway, the first phase is funded. So we have basically $500 million on the table. We've presented it to the Regional Transportation Council. We're going to monitor where the legislature is. I don't think it affects the first phase. It may affect maybe what is told or what isn't told as part of that particular combination. Um, and I just give you another example. If the legislature is successful, how we may be able to uh, look at maybe tolling single occupant vehicle capacity, but not tolling any of the HOV or other type of belts. So I throw out a hybrid approach as part of that particular mix. So we are in a transition. I think it's positive. I think we should give support to the legislature as they look forward, moving this pendulum towards pay as you go. I'm going to touch on the Trinity. Uh, Elizabeth will talk about this. Here's the volumes per day in thousands. Trinity is proposed to carry about 100, 124,000 vehicles a day. This is about 15% of the traffic if you measure across 35E and all the other uh, transportation quarters as part of the mix. It is the express lane for 35E Lower Stemmons and for the Interstate 30 Canyon. The Trinity is the express lane for 35E in the canyon. It has four major parts, regional, part of a balanced vision plan, part of a balanced design, focus on mobility and reliability. Lots of presentations on this. Our marching orders, our balanced vision plan, both from the community and from the city. Flood protection, recreation, transportation, environmental restoration, and economic development. All visions should be measured against those five uh, initiatives. When we talk about sustainable design, all of our offices, Jill Jordan is here from the city, Kelly's here from the state, Elizabeth's here from NCTA, we're here from the RTC, we want to stage and build a design that's consistent with the commitments we made in the balanced vision plan. <coughs> if there's questions on this, we can go back to 11 foot lanes, four lanes, fewer ramps, no trucks. Uh, talk about that in more detail. <coughs> back to the uh, most congested facilities. Lower Stemmons is the fifth most congested project in the state, and the Canyon Interstate 30 corridor is 19th. Now, the reason why the Canyon is so high. They're measuring all the way from 35E all the way out to 820. It's a pretty long section. If they just focused on the downtown Canyon section, I think the Canyon may be the most congested corridor uh, in the whole state. Observed speeds less than 20. Accident rate, again, two to three times the state average. 15% improvement in freeway speeds in the whole downtown area with the Trinity. 50,000 fewer hours of congestion per weekday with the Trinity. It has one of the highest benefit cost ratios we have in the region, almost five to one benefit to cost in the construction of this project. I don't think we have time to talk about the details of this. I think we do have to focus on how do we interface 35E in some form or fashion into downtown and into the Trinity. It may not be this. I think we need to focus on economic development, make sure we're not building something that displaces uh, community interest, uh, but additional work needs to be placed on that topic. Two items on thoroughfare streets. We hope to bring just south of this building funds for a, an additional thoroughfare street access back to system so as Dart's light rail system comes on board, which is under construction, we can provide thoroughfare street access to increase economic development between Interstate 20 and in and around the university. So we're working with Joe Jordan on an initiative uh, providing access back to the sustainable development brochure. Transportation provides the opportunity for economic development. Also in the title, I think we have a major opportunity with regard to thoroughfare access downtown. You've got Riverside Riverfront. We should call it industrial, I apologize. Riverfront. We're doing pretty good. On it used to be called industrial. Yeah, well, but that's over. It used to be, sorry, uh, we're doing pretty good on Irving Boulevard and Riverfront on the east side of the levee. I'd like to do an assessment of how we're doing on thoroughfare access on the West Dallas, Southern Dallas side of the levee, 
to make sure we have the same opportunity for economic development on both sides of that particular project. I happen to come from the opinion, looking across the levee and the signature bridges in the downtown actually is a better view than to be building on the downtown section looking out. If thoroughfare street access is a constraint, I'd like an opportunity to work with the city of Dallas and see what we can do to maximize economic development in southern Dallas in and around downtown. We have an SM Right Jobs Program uh, under uh, Council Member Davis. Um, the Senator, Senator West, has worked closely with Bill Hill and Textos. We're, we're training residents to learn the transportation skills to work on the projects that are in their neighborhood. We're also working with contractors to increase their bonding capacity to work on these same projects. So when I talk about system and synergy, I'm talking about all the way from building the transportation projects and creating an opportunity for the residents to be able to work on those same projects. <coughs> Sidewalks, we got a call from the previous governor, the Republican, to help former President Carter, uh, which I thought was a cool opportunity. Um, would we find funds for the Oak Cliff Gardens neighborhood when President Carter came in Habitat for Humanity? We went to the RTC to get $1.2 million in sidewalks. We also have a million dollars in sidewalks that we have with the city of Dallas. So if people are trained in that training program, we can put them to work on the sidewalk program until they uh, catch a job with one of the contractors. High speed rails come into downtown. Dallas streetcar, I could go on and on with regard to these particular opportunities. Senator, thank you very much for inviting us. All right, thank you, Mike. Everybody hear me all right? Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank Senator West for the opportunity to be here this morning. And uh, I do see some familiar faces in the audience. Uh, we were at uh, Judge Hill's uh, town hall meeting a few months ago, and I see some familiar faces that were there that day. We definitely appreciate your interest in our transportation system. Before I get started, I want to introduce some of the TxDOT staff that's here. Michelle Raglan is, uh, is here on the back. Uh, she's our public information officer. And if you do have questions about things uh, after you get a chance to look at the PowerPoint on, on the Senator West website, she's the person to contact and uh, she'll work with the staff at TxDOT to get you an answer. Mo Bird. Standing there beside, he's a Maryland Terrapin. He, he's our director of transportation planning and development. He's the person responsible uh, for the oversight of the planning of all of our projects in the uh, in the metroplex. And then John Hudspit from our strategic projects office is here somewhere in the crowd. Or John, lives here. there he is. Over there. He's hiding over there in the back corner. He's in, he's in the but uh, John lives down in the Soto area, and he joined us this morning. And he's also one of the people that's uh, responsible for the implementation of uh, these major projects in the Dallas Fort region. I want to start out this morning giving you a little bit of background uh, on the project. And there is a lot of information on these slides. I'm going to glaze over them, try to hit the high points. But I would encourage you, uh, if you're interested in the project, to download this presentation. There's a lot of detailed information in this presentation that, that will be helpful to you. And then after you do that, uh, for sure, if you have questions, contact our office and we'll try to get you answers. Uh, this project began in 2001 as a major transportation investment study. I think Mo was maybe in elementary school back then when this started, but uh, uh, it does take time to plan projects. Uh, the limits of the job are on Interstate 35E from Interstate 20 north to 8th Street and from US 67 from Beltline Road or FM 1382 down to Cedar Hill up to the to I-35 where 67 splits <coughs> out. So it's about an 18 mile project, huge project, uh, consists of total reconstruction of, of all lanes uh, and frontage roads and the construction of a reversible HMV lane at that time uh, in the center median. 
a lot of public involvement went on, input from the community. Actually de developed an aesthetic concept plan for the whole corridor and uh, received a, what we call a FONSI or a finding of no significant impact evaluation determination from the Federal Highway Administration. So that project uh, was environmentally cleared back in 2006. Uh, now, during the 83rd legislature, uh, TxDOT was granted the authority to pursue the, the oh, I'm sorry, okay. to pursue uh, construction of this project as a public-private partnership. Um, and the Regional Transportation Council, who Michael mentioned earlier, uh, you're going to hear a lot of the, about the Regional Transportation Council, but that's the policy board for uh, transportation planning uh, in, the, in the Metropolitan Planning Organization in the DFW region. It's made up of 44 members. Mostly are elected officials. There are some officials from, from uh, the transportation agencies uh, on that board. And, and they, they establish policy in the region. And then TxDOT, our role is to implement uh, those policies and decisions that are made by that Metropolitan Planning Organization and RTC. Since that, since that time, uh, well, first of all, the projects were lined up uh, in, in priority, and the, the LBJ project from 75 over to 35E was the top pro project in the region. That project has been delivered, and the State Highway 183 project uh, over in Irving was the second project, and that project has been delivered and is underway. And the Southern Gateway it was was then um, chosen as the next project to go. That's why we received legislative authority back during the last legislature to kick this project back off. We've got a lot of public involvement. You can see there, I think most said about 28 meetings with stakeholders, cities. Uh, we've been to some public meetings with uh, council members in the area. Uh, as I mentioned, Judge Hill uh, and Council Member Griggs. And some uh, council member care away. We've, we've uh, tried to put the word out on exactly what the game plan is uh, for this project. Broken into three segments. First segment being 35E from 67 to about Colorado Boulevard or 8th Street, where our Orsi project now is underway. Second segment being on US 67 from about line up to 35E. And then the third segment on 35E from I-20 to the 67 square. Uh, there's seats up here. And, and, and if we have some men that are standing, if we have some ladies that are standing. I know the men are going to be gentlemen. <laughs> the ladies sit down and please, let's not hold it. Also, there's, there's seats. We all can just kind of come together with us. Uh, there's seats on the front row of the wall. Now, Michael mentioned that uh, we've identified five hundred million dollars of uh, gas tax revenue dollars to uh, construct this project. But the overall cost of the project, if we reconstructed uh, and built it all at one time, would probably be about $2 billion. So because of that, we've adopted a phase <coughs> approach to the job. The first phase is to build the managed lanes, and then the second phase being to the total reconstruction uh, of the corridor, including the 67 corridor. So you can see here, uh, just, just quickly, uh, existing is four lanes uh, in, the, in the area from uh, 67 to Colorado, four lanes of general purpose lanes, and a, a reversible one lane HOV lane in, in the medium. Uh, the interim project that we're discussing today would also rebuild in the, the main lanes, the general purpose lanes of 35E, and construct a two lane reversible managed lane. And the ultimate project in this in this section uh, is just about the same. Along 67, uh, you currently 
Well, 35B from 67 down to I-20. Uh, currently, there is no HOV lane, but our plan would be to construct a reversible one lane managed lane uh, in the median. Ultimate construction would be to rebuild the frontage roads and add sound walls along that corridor also. Along 67, you have two lanes with a currently a concurrent HOV lane. Game plan would be to convert those two concurrent HOV lanes to a two-lane reversible managed lane. Ultimate reconstruction along 67 would add capacity, one general purpose lane in each direction and rebuild the service roads and uh, add pedestrian elements, uh, sidewalks, uh, adjacent to those lane roads. And then from I-20 to 1382, basically it would be a one-lane reversible managed lane and an additional <coughs> purpose lane in each direction with reconstruction of the frontage roads and uh, pedestrian elements also. Now, as I mentioned, the initial project was approved uh, with an HOV lane, and today, under the RTC policy, all HOV lanes are being converted to managed lanes. The HOV lanes were implemented uh, as an air quality initiative, also gave uh, reliability uh, ability to people that have carpooling and relieve congestion during the peak periods. I think the, the, the confusion, and sometimes we don't do uh, as good a job as we, we should at explaining the difference between an HOV lane and a managed lane and a tow road. I know when we start talking about tolls, people think you're going to toll the entire facility, and that's not the case. The managed lane policy was implemented by the RTC in order to, to attempt to provide an opportunity for drivers to select a, a, a way to drive and have a guaranteed travel speed. So basically it's about reliable transportation, an alternative for reliable transportation. As Michael mentioned, uh, there's discussion about possibly, you know, taking the tolls off of HOVs. Right now, the policy is an HOV would be half price during the peak hours, but it gives the opportunity for a single occupant vehicle to pay a toll in order to drive in that managed lane and, and have that guaranteed 50 mile an hour travel speed. The way you do that is the tolls vary based on the amount of traffic that's entering that lane. And so as the, as the speeds drop in that lane, the toll rate goes up in order to keep, keep the traffic volume flowing. And so people make decisions about whether they want to drive in that lane or just stay in the general purpose lanes. Uh, the question there, the managed lanes and take away existing general purpose lanes? No. Uh, it's an additional lane in that managed lane above what you have today. And the, the, the number of general purpose lanes always remains the same as before. Uh, the, the managed lanes were instituted. Some other uh, things we're going to accomplish in this project are safety enhancements. As you can see in this picture, uh, there are inadequate shoulders along much of this stretch of 35E, and so the project adds those shoulders back. I think the most important safety improvement of the project is the reconstruction of the Zane curve. If you listen to the traffic reports in the morning, so generally there's, you hear about wrecks uh, in the Zane curve. Sub substandard horizontal alignment there in the red, you see that's the existing. The blue line shows how this project will smooth out that curve and bring it up to today's design standards. The third, uh, there's very short entrance ramps uh, and very short uh, acceleration tapers. And so uh, part of the project, too, will be to reconstruct those, get longer ramps and longer acceleration tapers. That will definitely improve the operation as well as the safety of this corridor. Now, some of the changes that have happened to the project footprint since 2006 are we've added 14-foot outside lanes on the frontage roads. That, that allows uh, shared purpose with bicycles and, and, and vehicle traffic. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration has instituted that change on all of our projects so that bicycles will have the ability to ride in that outside lane and not be crowded by cars. We've also added pedestrian elements, six foot wide sidewalks along the northbound and southbound front frontage roads. Uh, 
We have added an additional access point to the managed lane near Marcellus so that traffic in that managed lane, if they want to go to Interstate 30, they can get out and also traffic will be able to enter there at Marcellus rather than in the initial plan you had to take the lane all the way to Reunion in order to get in and out. So this additional access point we think enhances the, the uh, operation of the managed lane. And there's additional noise walls that's been added due to new developments in the area since the 2006 environmental approval was received. Another a positive impact is there was a small right-of-way take at the zoo in the initial approval and we've been able to eliminate that right-of-way take with the redesign of the project. And for informational purposes, I know there's some concern in the, in the neighborhood, but there are no impacts to the McAdams Cemetery and no impacts to the 10th Street Historic District. Uh, our current status is we're working on uh, environmental clearance again for the managed lane, the conversion of those HOV lanes to managed lanes and building the interim project. Uh, we've, we've, we've been doing a lot of community outreach, as I said before, but we're expecting to have a public hearing uh, sometime this summer and uh, hopefully environmental clearance in the fall of this year. For the ultimate reconstruction, we'll do the same thing and uh, hope to have uh, environmental clearance by the fall of 2016. Now, I mentioned before about the ability to do a public-private partnership. In reviewing the estimated toll revenues for this project, uh, our, our folks at our strategic projects group uh, don't feel like this is a good project, that a concessionaire, similar to the, the how the LBJ project is currently being built, is not viable. So the game plan is to build this project similar to how we're building the Horseshoe Project. If you're familiar with our Horseshoe Project downtown, it'll be a design-build project, and uh, we will issue what we call a request for qualifications for uh, the consortium of the contractor and, and uh, engineering firms will submit proposals. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Uh, we'll, we'll submit proposals and then we will review those, shortlist that, and generally those, the, the, the uh, successful proposer is picked on a 70% uh, cost, 30% uh, qualifications and technical approach to building the project. Uh, it makes things go a lot faster, as you can see the Horseshoe Project. A lot of that construction started before the design was complete. They're responsible for uh, moving utilities, and, and it's a very good method of building uh, the project. Now, as far as the toll goes, it's going to be similar to our, th our I-30 project west of downtown, where NTTA collects the tolls for us. It goes into an account. That money's kept in the region, stays on the project for maintenance and operation costs and then we'll be there in order to assist with paying for the, the next phase, the ultimate phase of the project. And at the end, I believe, it, uh, we'll be, I'll be more than glad to take on any questions. Mentioned in his press release, I thought it was um, very important to repeat. 
that the, the Trinity Parkway project has been in the planning and environmental phase and study um, for more than 15 years, and I thought that was an impactful statement for him to make um, and very important. The NTTA tech stop, the city of Dallas, as well as um, the COG have been working closely with the Federal Highway Administration as well as the Army Corps of Engineers to advance the Trinity Parkway as well as the floodway project through the environmental process. And I think it's important um, that I explain in some detail the two um, decisions that we're, um, we're awaiting currently um, from the feds. One is the parkway and one's the floodway. The first one, the Federal Highway Administration, or FHWA as you commonly hear us call it, is reviewing the environmental document for the final environmental impact statement. Lots of acronyms. So the FEIS, that is currently under review um, by the feds right now, and we do expect their record of decision or their final decision for this project later this spring. So that's the parkway. The second decision we are awaiting is from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They, too, are currently reviewing a separate environmental document um, for the Dallas Floodway Project that includes the parkway and the planned lakes and amenities that you've heard much about. Now, and if people have questions about that, I'm sure the city would be um, happy to answer those questions at the end of the presentation. But I want to make sure everyone is very clear that that rod, too, is expected um, later this year. But without those two decisions, both of them, from FHWA and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, neither project moves forward. So let's move to the Trinity Parkway. This project is being um, environmentally cleared for the largest footprint that can ever be built. And I think that's very important. I'd like to talk about that uh, a little bit. I think there's some miscommunication um, on what that really means. You can see the alignment here in um, yellowish orange. The project starts up at the 183-35 split, um, continues south, goes into the levee in the Inwood area, goes to the east side of the levee, follows the toe of that levee downtown, all the way down um, to about the Cedar Crest area, comes out of the levee and ties into um, SM Wright and um, Phase 1, 175 about nine, a little over nine miles in length. There's approximately 11 connections along the alignment, and, and I'm not gonna go through each one, we can talk about them, but approximately 11 ways to get in and out of the Trinity Parkway. Design and posted speed, 55 mile per hour, and it will operate as an all electronic toll collection system roadway as all NTTA facilities do. <laughs> Okay, it wouldn't be a good engineering presentation from Kelly and I if it, we didn't have an engineering drawing, but I promise I've got some better drawings later. But I, I think this is very important, another concept that's often misunderstood. The ultimate section of the Trinity Parkway is being cleared for three lanes in each direction. You can see the red, if you see nothing else, you can see the red arrows um, in these cross sections. The width varies along the alignment as well. So the distance from the top of the levee, it, it varies um, generally an offset from 150 feet to maybe 400 feet. So there's some misunderstanding about how wide it gets into the levee. So I'm here to tell you from 150 to 400 feet from um, the top of that levee. But this, again, is the ultimate section. We always go to the Federal Highway Administration and tell them what the ultimate plan will be. We must consider all the effects of the ultimate situation. We never want to only consider an interim situation and expand later and, and not do the environmental process this way. So this is a very, very standard way of developing projects in this region. And I'm sure Kelly and Michael could list a host of other projects that have been done this way. So, that being said, we truly believe that the project will look different um, on day one, that it will be developed in a phased or staged approach, which Michael showed briefly before. And um, so on day one, the project uh, is more likely than not to have two lanes in each direction, um, four 11-foot lanes, no inside shoulders, building only one side of the bridges where appropriate, fewer ramps, so maybe on day one it doesn't have all those connections that uh, we talked about. 
55 miles per hour, no trucks, and on opening day it will have five park access locations um, for use into down into the parks and in, um, in all the amenities. So that being said, um, we talk about phasing and staging and what does that really mean? Well, here is a rendering, um, and again, you, you can get this presentation on Monday um, from the website, of what that could look like. So two lanes, this is on the northern section, maybe in the Wycliffe area, I'm just yeah, um, taking a shot at that. Two lanes in each direction, vegetated median, the slopes um, have native adaptive uh, plantings, a small wall. <coughs> Um, Multi-use paths will be built as part of this project and utilized um, from the park and the levee side. So this is a plan view. This is what you would see looking down on that. That's the tollway in the middle. This is as you move maybe a fur further south, a, a, a section at the commerce area. Again, two lanes in each direction, med uh, vegetated median, a multi-purpose path on the uh, left side, right side used by um, the folks using using the park so these are uh, just pictures that renderings we wanted to show people because there is some confusion about what a stage or phase project could look like for the Trinity Parkway so um, this is again the, the cross section um, as well as um, what it would look from from the overhead and again we can we can share those pictures um, as all of you know we are um, continuing to work we, we've mentioned many times before um, project partners to um, get this project through the environmental process. It's very important that we do that. As I stated, and I always state in public presentations, we can do nothing without that record of decision. But that being said, we the project partners in TTA, TxDOT, the city um, of Dallas, as well as the COG, do continue to meet to find ways that once that approval is given, that this project can move forward in a phased and staged approach. So um, that's the end of our planned comments, and we would be happy to answer any questions. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, so Southern Gateway has to take all that um, traffic. In the case of Trinity, Trinity is the express lane for 35E. It's grabbing 60,000 cars a day off of 35E over to Trinity. But 35E, Main Street, Texas, is going to be asked to carry a lot of the four million more people that are coming to the region. Now, uh, my hope is we can return the shoulders back to 35E and do a, some other elements, because 35E to me doesn't look all that great. So wouldn't it be nice if we stole a shoulder and it increased some of the safety issues? What if we were to be able to move that and then take a look at 35E? Uh, Kelly has some improvements in what is called lower stemmings. Move those horrible movements, weaving movements that come from 30 over to Woodall and DNT that are basically clogging up all of 35E. If we can pull those off, then maybe we could have a kinder, gentler 35E as part of this process, and that's part of the improvements he has on lower stem. Okay. Eric? Okay. All right. Matt, Matt, where's Matt? I just saw Matt a few minutes ago. Matt Trent. Matt. Okay, Matt has a Question, y'all need to listen to this question. It's a good question. All the questions were good questions. Today we learned that traffic projections are expected to double over the next few decades. According to TxDOT's own traffic counts from 2009 to 2013, I-35 north of I-35 slash 67 has gone from 193,000 cars to 178,000 cars. I-35 south of I-35 south of I-35 slash 67 has gone from 107,000 cars to 104,000 cars. And U.S. 67 south of I-35 south of 35 67 have gone from 99,000 cars to 89,000 cars. Did y'all all get that? All right. In other words, he's saying that the traffic count's going down. That's, that's, that's what he's saying. My question is, is what equation what is in the equation determining future projection, projections? And it's, is it simply X traffic today times Y population in the future, according to yesteryear's traffic patterns? <laughs> Have we factored in improvements to our public transit system? Is that your question? Hmm. 
I think it's uh, it's an excellent question. The facilities you talked about are at capacity, so they can't take any more cars during the peak period. Uh, they're carrying everything they possibly can. The only way those numbers could go up is if you started at traffic in the off-peak periods. You're, it's difficult to add traffic to those facilities in the off-peak periods because you have the uh, an accident reliability problem that's three times the state rate, and you have a lot of people who are saying, I'm not taking those particular quarters. And when I turn on Google Maps, I rarely take 35E. I'm taking the 161 toll road, or I'm taking 360, or I'm taking Loop 12, because the roadway is so unreliable, I'm taking a different uh, route. Uh, we do not just take trends and you forecast them through some sort of trend analysis. You locate population employment. Population generates trips, employment attracts trips. Um, we distribute them. We then see who wants to take transit, so transit is included. You assign them to the networks. Uh, on toll roads, you have about 40% less traffic than on a free road, because not everyone wishes to pay the toll. So all those are included in, in the analysis. If you go to the website, there's a mechanical process uh, to go through. You also are picking some data points that had the worst financial crisis in the United States in the 2009 to 2013 timeframe. Uh, we look at diesel fuel consumption in the state as an in, a good indicator of the economy that diesel fuel is largely consumed by trucks. Um, truck movements in that period fell through the floor. Your facilities are on the interstate highway system. Those truck movements are now coming up where they used to be as part of that particular process. Um, I think it's an excellent observation. I think we need to have longer, uh, more conversations about that particular data, and maybe we can put together a short white paper that talks about that issue, because I very much appreciate that question. Matt? Yeah, so I, I appreciate that response. Two things. One is, if you're taking into consideration the location of jobs, the biggest challenge now is there are not enough jobs in Southern Dallas. Right. Yeah. So, we're, so we're talking about building roads to provide more access to people who live in Southern Dallas to get the jobs in Northern Dallas. If we want to grow Southern Dallas, so let's bring jobs back to Southern Dallas. <laughs> It creates an opportunity for residents to have a choice. And yes, we are interested in people from southern Dallas not facing what is isolation, having to use Interstate 30 westbound every day in order to get to work so they can have more choice. And we're trying to fix the transportation problem to the extent to encourage developers to be able to come and locate employment in southern Dallas. So individuals in Southern Dallas's choice isn't always to go north, but actually solve their problem within their same neighborhood. I think you can't wish yourself to that situation. We think transportation creates accessibility to accomplish that. What is one of the things we did, just as an example? We built frontage roads on Interstate 20. Uh, let's go up down Interstate 20 15 years ago and today, and I'll show you how jobs were created because of the change in accessibility for developers to have access to land. And in my presentation, by creating additional access just south of this building to land that cannot be accessed, I will argue development will occur in and around this university, just like I want to review the thoroughfare system on both sides of the Trinity River to see if, in fact, we can change accessibility to create opportunity to land for an employment location there as well. Okay, um, John Henderson. John, where are you? John Henderson. Okay, um, we'll hold this question. The next question is from Brian. Um, Brian, uh, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce your last name. Bingring? Brian Bingring? Brian, okay, all right. Brian's, Brian's question is How does building bigger, faster highways really address safety concerns? And how is human driving behavior considered in the capacity design of roads? 
we, you know, congestion causes huge safety problems. Uh, and substandard geometry is also a problem where driver expectation. Uh, you drive highways and you, you have a, drivers have an expectation of certain geometry on, on, on roadways. Uh, you, you've got to, you know, when they're surprised, it's generally when you have a problem. But we can show you statistics and, and you know, we review uh, all of our fatal accidents on a monthly basis and generally we have highly congested corridors, that's where most of your accidents occur. Uh, most drivers <coughs> drive a prudent speed. I know that's hard for people to comprehend, but uh, all studies show about 85% of drivers drive what feels comfortable. There's about 15% that are outliers that are going <laughs> to you know, drive a, a faster speed than what, what feels comfortable, but most people drive a comfortable speed. It's that surprise of a sharp curve or something that's not expected that generally causes huge safety problems. And congestion is definitely a contributing factor to accidents. Senator, if people are outraged at the uh, curve at 175 under SM right, why aren't people outraged at the Zane curve? The Zane curve, the sight distance of the Zane curve, you've got to be kidding yourself thinking someone who isn't used to that coming up from Waco to visit grandma and they are taking that turn thinking they have a sight distance of what they're used to seeing and all of a sudden you can't see 30 feet in front of you because of that geometrics. That's what we're trying to fix with regard to the improved geometrics <coughs> on that particular roadway. There will be a specific example of a poor geometric situation that has to be improved for safety purposes. I want to also mention that we have uh, one of the board members from uh, uh, the North Texas Toll Authority here with us today, too, and he's been here all morning. That's Mr. Texas Casada. Thanks, Tex, for being here. So uh, he's listening to you, and also, obviously, when uh, the discussion comes up, he will have the benefit of this discussion. Mr. Charles, Charles Warper. Where are you, Charles? Here. All right, Charles, great question. Um, Text back. What's going on at the what's what's causing the delay in the completion of I twenty I I forty five flow? What's going on there? Well, that that's a very complicated bridge design. Uh, we're adding we're trying to add a, an additional lane, and we ran into a problem during the construction that we've been working with the original designer to uh, to work out. <laughs> We've got, we've got the issue worked out. It's a very complex uh, structural design issue. Steel bridges are act a little bit differently than concrete do. And uh, uh, it's an embarrassment, honestly, to me that it's taken as long as it's gone to mow back here. We've had some pretty uh, strong meetings in our office about this project. I want to apologize for the time that it has taken. But we think we've come to the, the final resolution I worked it out between our designer and our contractor. You should see work commencing in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we should have you back on the new bridge deck in June, and then the total project should be completed by November with both the lanes in place. That's a good question, because I, frankly, I've been meaning to get with text out about that myself. Uh, all right, that's a very good question. Uh, okay, all right, good. Okay. Um, uh, this is from my Glenn Wilcock, uh, and his question basically is, his question is basically, if for some reason the, we, we do the Trinity Parkway, and it's told, and the traffic count does not meet the projections in order to pay off the bonds, what happens? <laughs> Glenn, I'm sorry, Glenn, where are you? My goodness. Is that pretty much your question? Yeah, I mean, okay, thanks. there's a lot of assumptions that everybody's taking in on, on the flow on that. And if it fails like 635 and the 35 express lanes, mm -hmm. what, is it going to end up like 30 where it's paid off and it's given back? Well, I'll just say, as I stated, it's not through the environmental process. Exactly. But we, we do not know at this point what FHWA is going to say. So I, I want to start every sentence with that and make sure everyone's clear on that. If they do give us a favorable record of decision, 
Um, we must work to refine estimates and really make sure we truly understand at an investment grade level what this project is going to cost to build, what we will build, how much it will cost, what it will cost to maintain it, and how much the tolls um, is anticipated. We have a record of doing this that is, the NTTA does, that um, it's a good record. We have um, favorable, um, I guess, sway in the bond market, so people believe the estimates that we make, and we've made those estimates when it comes to cost, maintenance, and um, traffic and revenue. So any project, we hope to God that never happens, because um, that could mean a default on bonds, and everyone knows what that could mean. So um, we hope that that never happens. We just look to refine and use the best estimates and information we have, and we have a very good track record of doing that on other projects in the region. And I think, and I think that's a really good point because it is in your fiduciary interest to do that with a board member and with, with yours. The question I have, though, is we've got the large coal project down in Austin. Mm -hmm. that, that never panned out. Oh, yeah. well, uh, the estimates God. are full, the op optimistic estimates. The assessment that you have in the report is the best case, the largest case, which is what you guys have to do. So as an individual and as a toll paying individual where I have to pay a toll every day, the assumption that you're making and the assumption that you're going to take to the market and me as a consumer of your, of, of your street is going to make is you're going to build to capacity. So me as a public critic of, of the plan is that you're sending to the core the absolute biggest. And not, we're pretty sure that you're going to build the absolute biggest to support the flow. And the core of the, 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 the meat of the question is, is you're going to build this large freeway and you're going to make the economic assumption of people coming over from Sunnyvale and from the north and from the south and stuff like that. The problem that I have though <coughs> is that it's going to be stagnant. You're going to build this huge thing. It's going to sit... All right, you're going to need to ask the question because I'm not... Yes. <laughs> the question is, if we're going to be stuck with this this large hallway, that there's a good chance that not many people are going to use... Because All right, so the question is what? Are you going to give it back like you were... like uh, 30 was originally a thing? Is that ever going All right, to be... So, asked so is, it, is it ever going to pay it off and give it back to the citizens? No. no. <laughs> All right. All right, yeah. No, that's Glenn, 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 Glenn. For the project, four projects, we saw sell bonds for 30, 40, 50 years. My point in being to, to the point is you must service those bonds through traffic and revenue. And, and so there is, you cannot give a project back and take off the toilets when you have to pay back those bonds. So that's the process of the toll roads uh, for the NTTA system. We will have time to, and, and they will be here, but we're supposed to be. We've got some kids that uh, we've got to catch up with. Hopefully, we're still going to have them sell them to Montgomery in March this morning. But I wanted to make certain that Councilwoman Hill had an opportunity to address the town hall meeting on this issue also. <laughs> Senator, thank you for the meeting. Thank those of you who are here, those of you who have, have stayed. Um, unfortunately, I did not hear the presentations, but I don't believe there's anyone in the universe who does not understand that I fully, 100%, unequivocally support the building of both the Southern Gateway and the Trinity Parkway. Not to build them is a mistake for Southern Dallas. People are coming, traffic is coming, Yes, we must promote multimodal, but cars are not going away. Yes, we need to bring jobs to Southern Dallas, but I don't care how many jobs you bring, you've got to get to them, and you get to them with transportation modes. One person told me that instead of building the tollway, the, the Trinity Parkway that will be a toll road, is that those of us who are south could take the green line. I think not. I think I want the option of having my car if I want it. I may want to take the green line, but I may want my car. Recently, there was a post in the, in the Dallas Morning News, which I rarely agree with, but it indicated that if you don't have a car, it is very difficult to go job hunting. In addition, in addition to bringing jobs south, which we are doing, and we have been doing the last seven years that I've been on the council, in addition to that, there are people right now with jobs in the medical district in 
the love field area, those folk have to get from south to north to get to those jobs. And there is no mythical job with an entry-level position that anybody in a mid-level job at Parkland is going to quit because of this mythical job that is created at an entry level in the South. It will not happen. We can create every new job in the creation in the South, but that does not alleviate the fact that people have already got jobs in the North. They are mid-level managers. They are upper-level managers. They're not getting ready to quit those jobs. In addition, if you want folks from the North to come to the South, they got to have a road as well. It's not a one way out or stay in. It's a total two way thing. So, as I said from the beginning, I am unequivocally supporting both of these. If you want to talk to me further, you know where to find me. But have no, no, no misunderstanding about where I stand. This is good for the South. And I'm going to fight for it because it's good for the South. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. Sit down. Sit down, first of all. Sit down. Take a deep breath. Yeah. Okay. All right, now, first of all, you know, people don't do that type of stuff in my town hall. They just jump up and do that type of stuff. And I know you, I know you, and it's passionate. I mean, everybody's passionate about it, okay? Now, all right. Here's the deal. All right. But, and, and I don't mind getting the show of hands who's for it and against it. I don't yes. mind doing that, okay? okay. In fact, that's what I was gonna do. Oh. <laughs> but if you're gonna be against it, then what I'm gonna need is an alternative. Also, you can't just be against it, all right? And I think that we need to wait. You ready to go. I hope that you lean against it now and let's get all the data in, let's figure out what the highway, the, the Federal Highway Department, everybody's here. All right, so. How many of you, as a, as a project is in its current status, is against the Trinity Parkway? Raise your hands. Okay. Against. 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 All right. Put your hand down. Oh. How many are for it? Raise your hands. Okay. All right. For those that are against this, what I'm going to do is the following. I. It's been a rough week in Austin to me, as y'all can know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What, what I want to do is this. Uh, and text dot, NTTA, Mike, for those of you that are against it, I want you to come up with some alternatives. Okay? And once you come up with some alternatives that address the issues that we're talking about, then make certain you sit down with and we'll coordinate it through my office with these agencies, which are alternatives, so they can be evaluated. Is that a, is that a decent process? So we're going to have to jump up and go along like that. i got to do that at least once down in Austin. Okay, so, and so and I'd ask you all to sit down with, and, and, and here's the deal. If you're against it, all, I, I don't want Tech Stock to have 50 million different plans that they have to evaluate. You need to come together and get two or three different proposals for consideration to text that. Well, and, and then have, have these agencies consider it. Until I see something different though, I'm for the Trinity Parkway, all right? Now, second, let's talk about the Southern Gateway. How many of you are for the Southern Gateway, for the Southern Gateway Project? Raise your hands. How many of you are against the Southern Gateway Project? Okay. The same thing, okay? Those that are against it, and Catherine, you, you hit the nail on the head, I want to see exactly what that, that's going to cost, and I, and I appreciate that. Uh, for those who say, let's do away with 67, that ain't happening, all right? Oh, God, that's thank not going to happen. Okay, yes, thank you. Right. <laughs> um, but it's in terms of alternatives, those that are against it, come up with some alternatives, and uh, who's against it again? Against Southern Gateway? 
that, that, I'm pretty good when I put y'all to work now, I'm done. You, you don't want to put your hands up, okay. <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's against it? All right, Mr. Card, what, what is your background, sir? At this, at UNT Dallas? Did you go to UNT Dallas? UNT Dallas. All right, good. All right, so, oh, all right, so, do you have the time to work on coming up with a proposal? All right, so, those of you who are against it, get with Cardin, all right, and come up with some alternatives, and then you need to bring those into our office. Where's a tamarind? You feed them in the owl office, I'll make sure you know who, know who the person is. Um, in terms of the Trinity Parkway, who wants to take the lead in, in terms of some uh, proposals for Trinity Parkway? Matt, Matt Tranton, I know Matt, okay. Right. Who else wants to take the lead? Mr. Passionate? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so so what, what we want to do is this. Uh, those that those that are okay, those that are against the Trinity, uh, you have two points of contact. We'll meet over here. Well, not, not not today. <laughs> All right, so what you need to do is to sit down. Oh yeah, yeah, that yeah, but, yeah. Okay, so those that those that want to kind of organize in those yeah. groups, that's good. Thank you, Ms. Wong. Get in this corner for the Trinity and this corner for the Southern Gateway. All right, and then. Um, okay, one. Okay, Kelvin Bass is uh, my liaison for transportation projects. Uh, make certain that you give the point person to him, and I'm going to say within, I'm trying to figure out my legislative schedule, we will, for those groups, we will have separate meetings as it relates to the projects with the text out, and I'm going to ask that, what, uh, Kelly, and within two weeks? Within two weeks from organizing that you have something back to us that we can then set up with uh, uh, the agencies so they can review it, and uh, then, depending upon my legislative schedule, we'll have uh, for our meetings in, um, should this April already, it was, we, we will set up a meeting, okay? All right, uh, I see uh, Mr. Tanel Atkins has just walked in, Councilman, Mayor President Atkins, thank you for being here. Um, I want to thank you for being here today, hopefully, all of you had an opportunity to have input in the decision-making process. Those that live in the senatorial district, I wish it could have gotten to those that did not live in the district, but you can still have input. Now, as it relates to these groups that we just, the task force, I'm not gonna call them groups, these task force, I'm, I'm gonna ask that the individuals that I'm concerned about are those individuals that are more right, I give priority to their consideration, that live in the senatorial district, okay? Now, I'm not interested in everybody who has pecuniary interests and lives in far, far north Dallas that's trying to impact the southern sex stuff. That dog just don't hunt with me. All right? So uh, I'm looking for those who have a uh, interest in living in the district as opposed to those that live outside of the district. Okay? I, I thank you for now for those that if it, how many of this how many of you is this the first time you've come to a town hall meeting? One of my town hall meetings. Okay. Then you know that when we do eggs and issues, this, this is kind of like how the crowds are when we do eggs and issues. So hopefully you've had some eggs. If you haven't, get some of them because I had to pay for them. Make this going. Count those numbers. Hopefully you have had um, your fill of issues. Uh, now we have to get some resolution.